D bass. So if you one, two, three, four. Not as pretty as Crystal, but you'll do all right, all right? <laughs> God is so good to us, and sometimes we just don't always get it, do we? Uh, we've been in a series of messages that we've entitled Sync, having to do with getting our life in sync and synchronizing our life. I believe, and I'm one of those people who actually believes this, that God has a determined purpose for all of our lives. I, I believe there's the obvious will of God that we're all to you know, be like Christ and reach a lost world. But I do also believe that there's specifics and details to our walk and to our life, that, we, that God has a will and has a purpose. And it's important for us to discover that. And I believe not only in the long term of our lives and relationships, marriage, jobs, all those things, but even for today, I believe the Lord has something He wants from my life. He wants to accomplish through my life. I, I believe that there will be some uh, sovereign supernatural appointments in my life. And all of us should realize that. It's true. But to, to know what's going on, obviously, we have to get in sync with, with the will of God for our lives. We, we entitled the series Sync. But it comes from that word synchronize, which means to, to cause or to move or to go along at, a, you know, at the same rate or exactly together, whether we're in sync in, uh, with our words, our actions, our deeds. But who we are syncing to, the one in whom we find uh, the master regulator, the, the designer, the one who has developed uh, our lives and has a purpose for our life, is, is God our Heavenly Father. And that series of messages has been around that whole concept of getting our lives in tune with God and His will. Obviously, we talked about getting the right connection. Now, we've talked about also the idea about that it's obviously a very popular term today when, with all the technical things and iPads, iPhones, smartphones, and syncing all our equipment so everything's working on the same page. But how much more so with our own walk and our own life? So we talked about getting the right connection. You have to be born again. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus did, by the way, in John when he said, ye must be born again. When Nicodemus was asking, what must I do if I'm going to enter into the kingdom of heaven? You're going to have to have a relationship with God that comes through a birth experience whereby you surrender your life to Christ and you're made new by Christ. He comes into your life by His presence, His Holy Spirit, and dwells your life and you're made a new person. The second message dealt with the, you know, keeping the latest updates. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, obviously. That we don't want to grieve or quench the Holy Spirit in our life. That the Holy Spirit gives direction. We're let the peace of God rule our heart. He, he gives us peace. He gives us direction. And so we want to learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's movements. Now, last week, we talked about the applications, those different aspects of our life, getting all our apps updated. We talked about, you know, not last week, week before last, marriage and the importance of having our relationships, whether it's just a, a friendship relationship or a marriage, how important it is that we find out what God's Word has to say so that those things can be in sync with what God is up to in our lives. And part four was last week. We dealt with that application about our finances. And really, you know, for those who have faint hearts, let me give you a forewarning that we're going to deal with that again today. Amen? Because I think it's important we do find out what God says. In fact, I'm going to share with you a message today that in years of, of talking about finances and preaching on it, I've always kind of drawn in and pulled out this illustration, but I want to deal the whole sermon with this particular parable today where the Lord's talking about faithfulness and getting this part of our lives in, in sync with Him and what He wants to do and how He desires to work in our life. In fact, we're going to be talking about a parable that's probably one of the most uh, misunderstood parables of Jesus in, in many ways, that uh, it's been mistranslated, mispreached. Uh, I've seen this, this application, and it's found in Luke 16. If you want to open your Bible, we'll look at it in just a moment where people just miss the mark of what the Lord Jesus is saying. And he's talking specifically about how we relate to material things in our life in this parable. And he's given an illustration by means of the story. And then, of course, the way Jesus does with the parable, he gives clarity to it as he ends the parable up. Now, we talked about last week that all-important principle, and it's, it's born over into this message today. The important principle was in stewardship or management of our life that God owns what? everything. There's not one thing that God looks at in all the cosmos, all right, and cannot say over that, mine. <laughs> everything belongs to Him. Now, there's a lot of things you may think belong to you, but not so. They're His. You walk out and you get in that car and go home, you think it belongs to you, well, probably belongs to you in the bank, but <laughs> nonetheless, it ultimately belongs to God. Everything that car has in it, and everything it's made and composed of, God created, all right? So ultimately, you know, they stole the materials. It belongs to Him. 
Everything belongs to God. And we talked about the second part of that was, is an understanding that, that we're, we're to manage it. Whether it's with, in the Garden of Eden when God created Adam and Eve and told them to manage and, and, and multiply and produce and take authority over it and to basically extend the garden. All that was done as an as a, as a important part of stewardship in their life. They are to respond to what God's given them and the way that God wants them to respond to it. Now, and we talk about stewardship. It's, this is something that Jesus, you know, over half his parables talked about. The importance of understanding that God is the owner of everything in your life. He's the owner of your life. He's the owner of everything you've been given. Has come by his hands. You may think it was your talent, your personality, your strength, your backbone. Every one of those things were given to you by God himself. So ultimately, we have to realize that God is God over all things. But he's given us this, this blessed and this important responsibility to oversee all the things that he's given us. And we are, are to take that very seriously. If you, if you go to the scriptures and you look in Luke 16, maybe in your Bible, over the first of this passage, it has something like a little sentence up there that kind of tells the story. It says, the unjust steward. Maybe it says that. Uh, that's not, one, not in the original manuscripts of, of, of the, the text. Those little subtitles over verses and portions of chapters are put in there by the, by the translators and the, and the publicists and those who publish the, that particular Bible. It, 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 by the way, let me say, all those notes at the bottom of your Bible that somebody has, all that commentary, that's not inerrant and infallible either, all right? That is by teachers and, and men are fallible. But what is up here is infallible. It's the Word of God. So if you're spending all your time reading the commentator's notes, you might ought to get you a Bible without that. It's good to have that when you're studying and going deeper, but just for purpose of reading, I used to find myself reading Bibles with lots of study notes in the bottom, and I always found myself going with the notes instead of spending more time up in the study. So if, just for your own personal Bible study, when you start, read the passage without the notes. Let God speak to your heart. But you'll see it might say something like the unjust steward. And that is a misunderstanding of this passage. In fact, it confused me for a long time when I first got saved. I'd read that and I'd see something like, here's this unjust steward. Here's this thief and this cheater. And he's not managing stuff right. And, and then it says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward. What's God doing commending an, an, you know, a cheater you know, or a thief? So I think we need to understand that passage. So I want to look at that today, and, and you know, I think maybe back in 1999 or 2004, I, I dealt with this a little bit more, but I really want to expand the whole message to deal with this particular issue and what is being said here. Uh, I, I remember one guy, when I heard this, he said, this is really, if you want to know the truth of it, how to get a welcoming committee in heaven. And when you read through it, that's exactly what it, it's all about. Let, let's look at the passages. And now he was also saying to his, the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, a manager. And this steward was reported to him, you might underline that, as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you are no longer to be steward. In other words, you're fired. Wrap the books up. And the steward said to himself, what am I going to do since my master is taking away from me the stewardship? away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig, and, I, and I'm too ashamed. I'm, I'm not going to beg. I know what I shall do. Comes to this, here's the idea. So that when I am fired, removed from the stewardship, they will receive me into their homes. All right? I don't want to go out here and not have a place to go. And so he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began to say to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. And then he said to another, <clears throat> and how much do you owe the master? You know, how much are you in debt? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill, write 80. 20% discount. And his master praised the unrighteous steward because he acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Who are the sons of light? We are. And I say to you, here's the lesson. Make friends for yourselves by the means of mammon of unrighteousness. Y'all know what mammon of unrighteousness, don't you? What is it? Money. Go ahead and say it. I know it's, a, it's not a cuss word in church. Money. <laughs> that when it fails, and it will, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much, and he who, who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. 
If therefore you have been, not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give to you that which is your own? And then he goes to this, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and he will despise the other. You can't serve God and money. He said, you can't serve two masters. You're going to hold to one and reject the other and despise it or you're going to hate one and love the other. So if you follow the story and the storyline, if we break it down, let me give you a general consensus back to it that he says here that really how you handle the things that God has blessed you with really become a place of testing in your spiritual life. If you can't handle this, how can I give you something else? If you're not going to be faithful here, what makes you think I can trust you with some of the things that are, that are of, of greater value? If you're not faithful with money, God is not going to trust you, he says in verse 11, with true riches. True riches. If I can't trust you. And then he said in verse 14, this, the verse we didn't read through 13 is where we read. In verse 14, he says, And the Pharisees who loved money were listening to everything. <clears throat> Don't you know Jesus knew that? And I'm sure he picked the right moment when the Pharisees would be listening so that they would hear the message. Why? So as to deride them, so as to put them down? No, so as to give instruction, so as to give light, so as to give help, so as to, 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 to bring change into their life. But yet they love money and they love attention and they love material things more than they love the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse 8 is, is a very insightful verse. I don't think it's the key. We'll look at that verse in a moment. But in verse 8, he says, the people of this world are, are more prudent, are, are more shrewd than, than, than believers. They're, they're wiser managers than, than people who know Christ. His master praised this unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in the relationship to their own kind than are the sons of light. Now again, we said earlier, the basis of what we've been teaching is that God is the owner of all things. And this is what this lesson's teaching, that there's this manager who works for this master and in relationship, ultimately for us, the story goes, God is our master. And we're responsible to manage everything that he's put into our control. And so he's given this illustration and this story about this earthly master and this earthly steward. The guy is just the manager. He's not the owner. In fact, if you were to take this and look at it in the original language in which it's given, you'll see that the word here for manager or for steward is the Greek word ekonomoi, which we get our word economist or economy comes from. In other words, this guy is the economist. He's the financial manager, all right? Everything is put at his disposal. He makes the decisions. He can make the decision. He's been given the authority to make the decision that if somebody owes 100, he can give them a 20% discount. He's the business manager. He can give a 50% discount. He's the, whatever is best, is whatever he considers to be best is what he can do. And, and the manager, the owner has told him, you go get the, the books in order, you collect the debts, the bad debts, good. Get, you collect the debts, and then when, once that's done, you're done here, it's over with. So he put... In the same way, we see that God has put us here on the earth and we're supposed to be managers and we're responsible. And just as this man has been called to give an account now for everything he's done, so must we also all give an account for what we do. God holds us accountable. And I think sometimes we, we live like there will not ever going to be a, a, some kind of point where I have to give an account to God for the way I've done my life or the way I've handled my life. I mean, we're excited over the fact that once we give our life to Jesus Christ, there's, there's no judgment. The judgment's over. Praise God. I don't have to go to hell. I don't have to be judged for my sin. The Bible says it's all covered. That's the beauty of salvation is that, you know, the debt has been paid. The blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is sufficient to pay for all my sins. That's beautiful. That's exciting to know that I don't have to go to hell. I don't know about, it might not excite you, but it thrills me. I don't have to die and go to hell. I don't have to face death and with fear or with anxiety or with doubts. It's all been settled because of the grace of God. But now as a child of God, although I'm not afraid of that great white throne of judgment that the Bible talks about, there ought to be some kind of a understanding that I still will be held accountable in fact, Paul told the Corinthian church that we shall all stand at the bema seat, is the Greek word, that judgment seat where we'll be given rewards or we'll lose rewards, all right? You'll be, you'll be blessed or you won't be blessed. And there's going to be a time in heaven, I think there's going to be people who you, you think it's some kind of maybe like communism, everybody's equal. It's not communism in heaven, all right? <laughs> God has given rewards for faithfulness. 
and a lack of rewards will be given to those who are, are not faithful. It's a common theme throughout the New Testament. Don't miss it. But it's based upon, are we, are we going to be faithful people? We're not saved by works, but once we are saved, once Christ is in our life, works become very important. So he, he, this man says, hey, I'm, I'm getting ready to be dismissed from my job. I, I need to make some decisions here. So I'm, I'm too, I haven't got the back for digging ditches. I, I can't do that. And I'm not a beggar. So l let me put my mind, my, my, what can I do? Well, I, I can do this. And so he starts giving some discounts. And basically, as the Lord says, he's making friends. In fact, he'd be my friend if he wants to reduce all my debts in half. How about you? He'd be your friend too, wouldn't he? So he makes friends by the use of, 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 of this management position he's been given. Now, I say this is probably one of the most misunderstood parables because this man is called an unjust steward. There's a couple of key words that are, that are important to understanding this parable. And the first word is from verse 1, where it talks about it was told this man, this master, that his servant was unfaithful. It's the word dableth. It, it means to be falsely accused. It comes from the word di diablos, which we get the word for devil. We know that the Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser, the diableth of the brethren. He's always making accusations, all right? This man has been falsely accused is what the, the original text is saying. He was falsely accused. It wasn't true. He was accused of something. And I guess the error was that the master believed the report instead of really taking time to check it out. He just kind of takes it for granted. Well, this guy's a liar, he's a thief, I'm gonna, you're fired, you know. The unjust person, really not the manager, but it's obviously, I think, in some regards, the employer who dismisses, his, dismisses this employee, this manager, on the basis of lies. So understand, it should say the falsely accused steward, not the unjust steward. It's just a, a mistranslation that we, 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 we look at because we don't really take the time to see what he's saying here. And the other word is metastatho. Now, that's a common Greek word that I mean, we talked about in Greek mythology and all the things and ideas, which had to do with death, that when you're taken from this world and you're placed into the next world, that's a metastaso. And this is what happens, we would just say, when, when, when you die, all right? Acts 13, 22 uses the word removed from this world, but it's the same word. It means to be taken from this world. And, and the idea here, the basic lesson to the, to the, to the story is that when, when this man is... Uh, given his walking papers, when he's fired, he's, he's required to collect the, the bad debts and such that are due to his Lord, little L, his master, before his final removal, before he's taken completely out of the way. And so what he does, knowing that he's going to be set out with no relationships and no friendships, he's going to engage in the forgiveness of debts of the people who owe his master. And so he starts reducing the bills. Now, the, the bottom line story for us as Christians is there's going to come a day that when we're going to be put out from this world and into the next world, all right? And we'll look at a verse there in just a moment that talks a little bit more about that. And we, we should be the same way. We should start engaging ourselves from the moment we make a commitment to Christ and our lives are changed. We begin to engage in the declaration of the forgiveness of debts. That's what we call witnessing, by the way, all right? That we tell people that the debt has been paid for sin. And we start immediately. And by our actions, by our deeds, by, by good works, by witnessing, by living examples and words that follow our example, uh, by sharing Christ, by, by giving to, to church, to missions, to ministries, all those things are an announcement to a lost world that sins have been forgiven and the debt's been taken care of. So we want to do the same thing. We want to engage in the declaration of debt has been taken care of. The most important thing that any child of God can do on, on this earth, why they're here right now, is, is to live your life with an understanding that we're all accountable to God, but we use resourcefully, wisely, prudently, shrewdly, carefully everything that God has given us for the glory of God in our lives. We will be stewards. And verse 9 says that when you're called to give an account, we're going to all give an account. He collects the least part of the debts due his master. And what happens? The master is pleased that something's being paid when it hadn't been paid. It pleased the debtors who were unable to pay the whole amount, obviously. It cleared their debts. What happens as a result? He becomes friends with them. Why? He says, so that they would receive him into their homes. That when I'm out and I'm tossed out and I have no place to go and no, nothing to eat, these are people who are going to help me. Help me find work, help me find shelter, help me find food. 
I've made friends with them. They're going to respond in like manner in the way I help them. Now, again, Jesus is talking about an issue of management here, but he gets to a greater picture of what we're supposed to do. In verse 9, the Lord says, the people we win to Christ constitute a welcoming committee in heaven. All right? What are you saying here? So that when you're put out, again, he's given the first eight verses, seven and a half verses there. He's talking about the physical picture of this steward and this, this master, and then begins to move to the application. All right? The application is for us as children of God, when we are put out, when we're set out into the next world, that there will be those, and he puts it this way, who will welcome us in to their eternal habitations. Now, I don't know. There was years, years ago a song came out called Thank, Thank You. And it was a, the whole context behind the song was is that when you're in heaven, that one day people are going to come up to you and they're going to say thank you. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you because what you did resulted in me hearing the gospel. What you did, whether maybe you told me in person or, or maybe you supported that ministry, that church, that mission, but those people were able to do what they did because you did what you did. Thank you. And this is what the Lord's saying here. So they'll welcome you into their eternal... Uh, in, in, where, where are the eternal habitations? Anybody know where they are? They're in heaven, right? And this is what he's saying. There's going to come a day when you're going to see a result of everything you did. Maybe you give money weekly, you support, you sponsor, you, you, you stand by what the body of Christ is doing, and you don't always see the results of it, all right? We give a lot of money into mission fields, into ministry of mission fields, and we don't always see the, 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 the results around us all the time. But the Bible says it's going to come a day when you will see it, and there'll be people who will actually know what has been done by you and by others so that they'll respond in such a way that they're going to say, come over to my place. And let's praise the Lord together. Come over to my place. I want to tell you how God did that. I want to show you what your giving did, how you're helping, how, how your words made a difference. I want you to come see what God did. I, and so this is basically where they get the idea of how to get a welcoming committee in heaven. Amen. Because he says, when we die, all right, and the Greek word here is when we die, he's using that verse there, is the word eclipto, which has to do with an eclipse. We get that word from it. What happens when an eclipse? Well, one body that's greater size than another body blots out so you can no longer see the other body. This life is going to be taken from this world and people are no longer going to see me. But just because you no longer see me doesn't mean I no longer am. Amen. All right? I'm, I am going on from here. This world is not my eternal habitation. There's another place for me. There's another place for you. And those people whom you love that love Christ and who have been eclipsed, who've gone out into the next world, they have not ceased to exist. We are eternal creatures. God gave us a soul. And we are body and soul and spirit. So we are more than just what, you know, this is just a, a suitcase, all right, that carries everything. And, and so much of the time we look at ourselves in the mirror, we look at other people, and we think that that's the person. No, the person is what is in there, all right? You are inside this. This external thing will decay and give way to death, but this internal person will go on into eternity, all right? So we are more than just a soul where the body, we're a body with a soul. Does that make sense? We're a body with a soul. And that which is going on is that which is, is going to go out into eternity. So when we die, when we are eclipsed, and verse 8 is the, the literal translation of this, which creates the problem here. It doesn't always get translated correctly. And the Lord commended the economist or the business manager of unrighteousness or unjustice. Uh, here's the thing about it. Number one, God doesn't commend anybody that's unrighteous. All right? He commended him, but he was a steward of unrighteousness. What, remember what we said a while ago? What is the unrighteousness, the unrighteous mammon? All right? It's just money. It's material stuff. It's not righteous. There's nothing wrong in itself. Money's a tool, but, you know, it, it, it can be used for righteousness and, and, and for holiness and for good things. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Amen? It's when we fall in love and we think material things are going to make us happy. And we, we get greedy. You say, Brother Joe, I'm not greedy. I don't want everything. I just want more. <laughs> just, keep, just more, and I'll be happy. And, and the bottom line is we just get greedy. And we're covetous, you know. I, I was taken out. I, I took a couple of days off. Tim Strickland and I went out with Gary Canna, and, and uh, he took us out to a game ranch. And I kept remembering this scripture. says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ranch. It was a, it was a beautiful place. <laughs> 
I mean, it was spectacular. It was beautiful. They had all this wild game. It's just a, no, I, I didn't shoot anything, so nothing for me for the wild game feast. But nonetheless, it, it's just that we see stuff. Oh, I need that. I want that. You know, and we're just surrounded with it. We talked about that last week, and it's so easy to, to fall into that trap that, that where we think that money is going to, to make, us, be, make us better. But the true story is the Lord commended the business manager of unrighteousness. All right? He didn't commend him of unrighteousness. He's a manager of unrighteousness. Do you understand the difference? That's what he does. He's a, he handles unrighteous mammon, and he handled it properly, and he was commended for handling it properly. And the Lord says, that guy was sharp. I wish the sons of light were as sharp as the sons of darkness. <laughs> Don't you wish you were as smart as they are? But we're not. And it's the Lord who said that, that we're not. I mean, in Acts 1-8, the Bible says that, that Judas received money. All right, and the word there was, was this, the, uh, the, 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 he received for turning in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was called, uh, it was called the pay of Adikias, the unrighteous stuff. All right. He had an unrighteous ax, but it was all about, you know, what it was. It was blood money. And in this regard, for this particular man's situation, uh, the same words are used, but the idea is it's, it's, it's not him that's the unrighteousness here. It's the unrighteous stuff he handles. And again, it's, it's not that it's, it's evil in itself. It's the love of money. But catch, and I think we help me catch it a little bit closer. If we look at the way he says, he, the, the sons of this age are wiser. The word there is translated maybe wise in your Bible. Uh, sometimes it's translated, in, uh, a mindset, New American Standard, it says shrewd. Yours might say prudent. But there's a difference in those words about wise and prudent or wise and shrewd. Uh, and the Bible, very careful about, in the original language, which words it uses in which place. This particular word used here is the word phronismos, and it means no, to know how uh, to be wise in the ways of the world ultimately, to know how to regulate your affairs with human beings and with people. You, you know, you're shrewd, you're, you're prudent, you, you know how to deal with those kind of things. So, and, and the Lord says to him, you know, it's, 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 it, you're, 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 he's prudent. He knows how to regulate his affairs with people around him. And that would be the word prudent. For us as Christians, we have more than just prudence. We should have wisdom. Wisdom is based upon the Word of God and the ways of God. Prudence sometimes is just based upon a worldview and what's, what would go best in, for the moment and the time. Wisdom goes beyond that. Wisdom is that which comes forth from the Father. And that is the word in Scripture. The Greeks use the word sophos for wisdom, all right? And to have wisdom is not so much how to regulate your affairs with humanity, but how do I regulate my affairs with God? If I learn how to operate my life according to God's will, that's wisdom. And it's far above just being shrewd or being prudent. It has to do with a, a much higher level of kind of living. You say, well, what do you mean? In other words, if I'm wise, I'll learn to let God manage my life. And then I will manage my life according to the way he wants me to manage it. Does that make sense? What God wants, that's what I do. If I just try to run my life according to the way I think is the best, I'm prudent perhaps, it's still not sufficient, and it, it doesn't really bring about the proper understanding of what life is really supposed to be like. If your life is managed by God, you'll manage your life best. If you seek to manage your life by the world standards, the world system, what the economists of the world say, the business people of the world say, or even what you might think is best, you're going to miss the mark because there's more than just right here and right now. There's eternity that lies out there beyond, and I need to live my life in a way that affects eternity. In fact, the Bible calls him prudent. Why is he so prudent? Because he did three things. He looked ahead. He said, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't dig ditches. That's about the only jobs available right now, and I'm not going to get out there and beg. So he looks ahead. It would be prudent or wiser for us to look ahead and realize, hey, there's an eternity out there. I can make a difference right here and right now for eternity. My investments can be different. My life can be, my giving can, can do something that literally changes people's lives. So he looks ahead, and then he plans ahead. He, he makes some decisions, and he also acts quickly. Well, those three points alone would transform our financial life. If we would look ahead and realize, hey, you know, that can make a difference. And I, I don't want to be that guy in heaven nobody talks to. <laughs> Amen. I don't want to be that guy that's there. He got saved. You know, he, he's in. He trusted Christ. But, you know, his life absolutely had no eternal value. Made no, when Jesus said, you know, you put your treasure, you know, where moth and rust don't corrupt. What's he talking about? He's talking about investing in lives, investing in souls, investing in people, investing in lives and hearts of people. There's four principal points here that we should learn about money from this and not worry. I'm not going to take 40 minutes, just a couple minutes on each one of these. But look what he says. First of all, he talks about the purpose 
of money. What is the purpose of money? All right. Well, verse 9 kind of gets it. Basically, says, you know, the greatest use of our money is, is to invest it in, in getting people in heaven. You get a welcoming commitment that, that lives will be changed and, and people's li lives and hearts will be forever transformed and they'll enjoy heaven. Verse 9 says, so that when they are in their everlasting habitations, King James, New American Standard says, their eternal habitations. Where are those again? Those are in heaven. So use your money, he's saying. The purpose of your money. Yeah, God's going to meet your needs. God wants you to have shelter and food and clothing and the things that are necessary for life. But don't forget that a portion of your money needs to be invested for eternal things, to make a difference in people's lives, to, to, to develop and invest in friendship for e eternity. So that when you get to heaven, people are looking for you. They're expecting you to come. They won't tell you something. They want to thank you. They want to pat you on the back. They want to rejoice with you and what God did because of your life. So that when they see you in heaven, they're excited, not shocked. Amen. Some are going to be shocked. He got here? Okay, anyway. <laughs> Matthew 6, 20 talks about where your treasure is. That is where your heart does. I don't know if you are familiar with those who, you know, sometimes when you lose a loved one, you give the funeral director a suit to put on that particular loved one. Many times, or you can just buy a suit from the funeral directors. But the funeral directors, they have suits that are tailored. They're nice. They look good. But, you know, there's no real pockets in them. They're just fake. And why don't they put pockets in them? They don't put pockets in the pants. They don't put pockets in the coats. No inside pockets, you know. Why? Because you're not going to take anything with you. You're going to leave every bit of it behind. Every bit of it. And the government's going to get a bunch of it, perhaps. Or those bratty kids that never learned how to handle their finances to start with, they're going to get it. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But you know, they're made that way because, hey, you need to use what God's given you at this point in your life. You know, and the only way to get money into eternal habitations is to send it there. And you send it there by investing in souls because souls are the only thing going to heaven. That's how you get it there. So he's saying, use your influence. Like this man had an influence. Use your influence for good. Use your affluence for influence. For good. That's the purpose. The second thing was the pattern for living. Verse 10 says, if I am faithful with what I have, God can trust me with more of it, all right? If I'm not faithful with what I have, then how's God going to trust me with anything else? If I won't do what he wants me to do with what he's given me to do right now, why should God ever give me another thing in my life? We talked about last week, you know, in the context of, of just understanding proportional giving, that we learn to give a portion of what God's blessed us with. You know, well, I just can't live without it. Folks, we're talking about a dime on the dollar. And I've discovered that if I've taken care of the dimes, he'll take care of the dollars. But, you know, if I have trouble with the dime on a dollar, how am I ever going to get the dollar? Well, I'll just work harder. You can't work if it's not for God. You can't breathe if it's not for God. You can't walk if it's not for God. You can't stand if it's not for God. You don't have anything if, if God doesn't give it to you. Yeah, you know, it's, I heard someone say one time, you know, when, when I make it big, then I'll give back. I make it big, I'll give big. You're just lying to yourself. If you don't give when it's little, the Bible teaches you won't give it when it's big. Faithful and little are not. It's like the, you know, the, 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 the man who was giving testimony in the, in the church, and he was talking about you know, how he was a millionaire now. And he, he was a millionaire because it, when he was a young boy, you know, God had blessed him with some money, and the, there was a missionary in the church who came and, and shared the stories of the mission field, and he was so excited about it, and so he gave everything he had. And today he's a millionaire. One little boy in church stood up and says, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> Is it easier to give when there's 100,000, uh, maybe the dime on the dollar? Or is it not easier? It's not any different. It's still a dime on a dollar. Well, I just, you know, it's hard. Well, let's pray you just make a dollar then. So it'll be easy for you. So you won't have to struggle with this. That's not what we want. We just need to learn to be faithful because the purpose of money ultimately is that, you know, for the glory of God, our life lives. For, and the pattern for living is that we learn to give and to, to give the way of the Lord. The third part here is the principle of blessing in verse 11 where the Lord is saying, you know, this money really becomes a test of, of whether I can trust you with the true riches or not. Can you be trusted with, with the true riches or not? I'm using money to test you. What I do with my money determines on really how God's going to bless my life. 
And I'm talking about far more than just physical blessings, folks. I'm talking about the real values. He said, how can I bless you with the, with the true riches if you won't be faithful with, the, with these things, with unrighteous stuff, with just money? If you, can't, if you can't deal with money, how can I give you true riches? What are true riches? Well, obviously, he's not doing my salvation. I'm already saved, all right? I know Christ. I will go to heaven. But true riches are is life and fullness now. Kathy and I, not too long ago, were sitting there watching and flipping through the channels, and there was one of these award shows. I just can't stand award shows. It's usually a bunch of rich people giving awards and trophies to a bunch of other rich people. But anyway, and telling each other how great they are and how they're the best and all and all it goes. But, uh, you know, I sat there and I looked across the room and said, look at all those people. They are the movers and the shakers of the generation and the culture. And probably 1% of them really understand what life's all about. They don't have true riches. And most of them get and get and get and get and get and have nothing to show for it in their lives. They're not happy. They move from marriage to marriage, relationship to relationship. Their kids are rebels in jail and troubles and drug addicts and everything else. I said, it just goes on and on. They don't have true riches. I said, if the truth were known and they saw just what you and I have in our life as a result of a relationship with God, they'd sell everything they had. Just... But that doesn't buy it, and that doesn't pay for it. True riches don't come from money. But God's saying, you know, it's important you learn how to deal with these things so you can understand how to deal with the most important things. And if you're not going to deal with money right, what makes you think you're going to deal with your time right, your family right, your relationships right? You're just going to miss it all across the board, and you're going to miss it on every step. And there's this great principle of blessing. We've talked about it before. You know, give and it shall be given to you. But ultimately, what he's saying here is, you know, what I do with my money so often determines how much of the blessings of God I experience in my life. You say, well, I don't believe that. That's what the Bible says. All right? This is what Scripture says. It's clear in passage after passage that there's a direct relationship with my physical money, finances, how I handle it, and the spiritual depth of my life. I wonder if you'd give yourself a little test today, maybe, and go back and look at your own spiritual life. Maybe go back to sometime last year when you knew you were just in the pit spiritually. And go back and look at your giving during that time. It might be a little shocking experience for you, a little shocking uh, journey down memory lane, but it'd probably be a, a good one for you. I think we, we, we find out what's really important in our life. So how do I know what's really important? Well, you can really determine. You can go back and you can look at your schedule, your time. What do you do with your time? How much time do you give to Christ and to the Lord and to the things that are of spiritual value versus how much time do you give to the world? What portion of that goes to Christ? And then you can also look at your checkbook stubs, all right? You go back and look at your inventory the, and you just inventory your life and where your giving's going, how much money you spend on everything and how much money really is spent to, to, on, on, on things that are eternal because the way we spend our time and our money always is a good indicator of what we say is important to us regardless of what our mouth is saying. This is reality. Amen? Inconsistent giving leads to inconsistent living. That's just the scripture. You show somebody, I'll show you someone who's growing in, in how to manage their life and their affairs and their money, then they're growing in all kinds of other areas as well. Because they're learning to be faithful to God. The fourth point was this, the priority of loving in verse 13. He says, you know, nobody can serve two masters. You ever been in a job where you had two bosses? Drive you crazy, doesn't it? It's just impossible because you love one, you want to hate the other. You despise one, you hold to one. And anybody who's ever tried to walk for two bosses, it drives you crazy. But the Lord gets down to this. is, says, you know, the heart of the problem is really the problem of the heart. Where's your heart? Because where your heart's, that's what's going to determine things. If your heart's not right, then you, all these other areas are not going to be right. All right? But, but when the heart is right, it's amazing how other things get right in your life. So the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And there's two conclusions from this verse. One is that I must choose what I'm going to love most in my life. Am I going to love success, stuff, or will it be the Lord? Who's, who am I going to love the most in my life? If I love God the most, it's not really a big deal. Now, I can come up with a thousand reasons, and I've gone through those exercises early on in my spiritual life where I said, well, you're not going to use this money more. Right here. And I suffered for it. But when I began to learn the lesson that, hey, you put the Lord first in these areas, everything else will be taken care of. If I honor God, he honors me. Valuable lesson in life. If I honor God, he honors me. What happens if I don't honor God? Well, I'm not going to experience the blessing and the honor of God in my life. The second point is, money is, is to be used, not loved. And there, we put such an emotional attachment on things, materialism and money. We, just, we chew to love it. And we miss 
the greater riches and the greater blessings of our life. And that's not what God has for you in your life. And I think if we're really going to get in sync with God in our life, then it involves every aspect. You, you can't dissect your spiritual life and say, oh, I love God, I go to church, I pray, I read my Bible, you know, I love God, but you know, what I do in my secular life over here, that's another world. No, it isn't. If I really do love God, and I really am interested in spiritual things, then the way I treat you, the way I treat my wife, the way I respond to my children, the way I live my life out in the world, it's all affected by that. All right? But if I think I've just got to have another penny because I've got to have another penny, I need that dime for me because I need this, you have missed the mark, dear friend. And you're not going to experience the fullness. And I will guarantee you if that's been your life, whether you want to admit that's what it is or not, that's what it is. But I can guarantee you if that has been the problem in your life, then you're suffering. You're missing out on the greater blessings and the greater treasures of your life that God has for you. And that search for significance and that search for peace and that search for harmony and that search for unity and that search for life itself is going to continue to be a dead-end road in a rat race for you. Because you put value on the wrong things. Now, I know that's not a message a lot of folks like to hear. But I tell you, when I first heard it and began to respond faithfully to it, as a single young man in ministry, God transformed my life. And then when I got married and we began to transfer that into a marriage relationship, that was the very thing that got us from day to day to day. And whether you realize it or not, it's still the same thing that gets you day to day to day. You may think, well, I've got a bank account. That could all disappear tomorrow. I got a good job. It could disappear. Some of you know this. It could disappear tomorrow. Well, I've got a little, little nest egg. Now, snakes have been known to breach the nest egg. Moth and rust do corrupt. Time destroys, but not with God. It is so good to know and to have such security and peace to know that if ever friend I had in this world disowned me, if ever amount of money and pressure and blessing that I had in my life was lost, if the house is gone, the cars are gone, and everything else is gone, I don't have to worry. I don't have to be afraid. Because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Isn't that good to know? It's great to know. And it brings absolute security and absolute freedom. If there's a lesson you want to learn as a young person, it's this lesson right here. Teach your kids this lesson. If you give them allowance, teach them to tithe off their allowance. And then you carry it on into your life. Well, that's just a beginning place. And you learn to give more over and abundant because you realize, hey, there's something going on here in an eternal way. Lives are being touched. Homes are being affected. People are being changed. Their lives are being renewed. Hope is being given. Despair is being di diminished and destroyed. People are coming into fullness. People are discovering what it means to be free and over and over again, all the things you've experienced, you continue to carry out so that other people experience it. Now, I'm not going to give an invitation. If I did, I'd probably just put the offering plates up here. But I do want us to bow our heads for just a moment so the band doesn't have to come. And I really would ask you, you know, not to be offended at this message. All right? Because it's not there to offend any more than Jesus was saying it so the Pharisees could hear it. He wasn't trying to offend them because he came first to them to give them hope. And they loved themselves and they loved their ritual and they loved their religion and they loved their money when they loved God. So don't be offended because that's not what it's about. It's about truth and truth sets us free. It's about you graduating. It's about you moving forward. It's about you going deeper. It's about you being an influence for eternity. So allow God to do work there in your heart and life. Say, Lord, if, if this is where I've been unfaithful, I need to get faithful here. And I ask you to forgive me for not handling the things you've given me in a righteous manner. I pray in the name of Jesus that you wash me and cleanse my heart. And I want to choose to serve you in this regard in my life. You have blessed me, and I have not been faithful. But from this day forward, change is coming, starting now. Can God have that kind of liberty in your heart and your life. And then I would say to those who found a place of faithfulness in regard, where are you and when's the last time you said, you know, I need to, I need to do a little more than what I've done forever.
I've been doing the same thing for a long time. I need to step up another level. There's more people to be reached, more lives to be changed, more work to be done. What would you have me do, Lord? And be faithful. Be faithful. I, I'm not the preacher who goes through your giving records, all right? And every week sits down and finds out what everybody gave. God is faithful to you. It's time for us to be faithful to him. So can you surrender to him in that regard? Can you say yes to Jesus? Can you willfully say, Lord, yes, 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 to what you've told me? And see what God does. Watch him. He's the one who said, test me and try me in this. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out of you a blessing that you cannot even contain. And Father, we know today that this is not about us getting. It's about us learning to be responsible and to be mature in our lives. Lord, not to be keepers and squanderers and holders and greedy, but God, to be, to be like you, to be a giver. Lord, that's where our blessings come back to us. And it's not, Lord, we know for the sake of just getting it back, but there's great joy. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. We found this to be true when we do it. So I ask you for your mercy and your grace, and that anyone today who's bound by materialism and greed and covetousness today, that those chains will be broken. Lord, you know my heart. We're not preaching this message to get more money. We're preaching this message so people can walk in freedom in their life. So thank you for your goodness. May we receive what you've given us. But may we, more than that, may we be proper managers of what you've given us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. A couple of things I want to remind you of, ladies. First of all, is that the wow share. Uh, I mean